Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome. Welcome to, th to those that are day one and welcome to those that it's day two. Hope last night wasn't too heavy. Um, welcome to um, the Health, Health and Justice and Specialised Commissioning Children and Young People's Mental Health Transformation Work Stream. Um, in a mouthful itself. Um, you will have um, been given a slight introduction to our work this morning as um, Andy and Hugh, amongst others, introduce complex needs, the cohort. I'm sure it's nothing new to you at all, um, but delved into some of the brain activity, some of the complexities leading to complex behaviour, um, and some of the interventions that we're working towards in terms of the collaborative work to try and meet the needs of the complex cohort. So um, this morning's session looks to take you a little bit further into some of the work that was mentioned this morning, but also some of the other projects within our work stream. So just a few people more arriving. I'll just wait for them to settle down and then we'll take you through the overview of our programme, some of the details of the work stream, and um, over to our guest speakers to go into some more detail on each of the work stream projects. So my name is Sue Sherrard. I'm a programme implementation lead for the Children and Young People's Mental Health Transformation Workstream. My background's in justice. I'm seconded over from the Youth Justice Board, but I've been with NHS England for the last year in terms of project managing and implementing this workstream. I will introduce my colleagues to you. So we've got Dr Nick Hindley, um, consultant child and adolescent, adolescent forensic and... Sorry, Sorry, I should have let you introduce yourself, shouldn't I? Um, in fact, I'm going to get my glasses. <laughs> 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 well done, Sue. Yeah. Uh, I can't see it so small. Sorry. It might help if I can actually see the slides. Okay, consultant, child and adolescent forensic psychiatrist. And Nick is the clinical lead for our work stream and also um, a clinical lead for the specific community forensic CAMS workstream proje project within the workstream. Um, Dr Andy Rogers, consultant clinical and forensic child and adolescent psychologist, and he's the clinical lead for our Secure Stairs uh, workstream project. Dr Paul Mitchell, independent consultant in health and social care. He's part of our central implementation team for Secure Stairs. And Claire Braid has joined us from the North East and she's a child and young children and young people's mental health transformation lead within health and justice. So um, in the next hour, we will be looking at the overview of the work stream. Work stream project one went by the name of Specialist Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services for High Risk Young People with Complex Needs. You're probably beginning to see lots of long names here, so we decided to um, have a cribbed version of Community Forensic CAMS. Workstream Project 2, development of a framework for integrated care for the children and young people's secure estate. We've bridged this to secure stairs. We'll go into what that actually means in more detail. And Workstream Project 3 is collaborative commissioning networks. A little bit easier. We will run through where, we're, where we are now and the national update, and we will leave questions and discussion to the end. We're quite tight for time, so we've got about an hour left. Um, what we will want to do is run through each of the presentations, which I think, com I think we're trying to condense quite a lot of slides into the time. I don't think we'll run through all of the slides, but they'll be there to be taken away, so there'll be extra information for you. But if we can leave questions to the end, that would be really helpful. I assume, where's Ollie, that these <coughs> slides will be going out as part of the whole conference pack. There's a bit of paper on the, bit of paper on the projector. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right, good to go. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to have to do a song and dance on this one. Okay, so I hope I'm not blocking too many people. Okay, so the overview of health and justice and specialised commissioning. And you might already be thinking, those of you in the field, how is this health and justice and SPECCOM? Um, 
a lot of the work we're doing or some of the work streams are key players here with CCGs but we wanted to ensure that the young people that work within the health and justice pathway were recognised within the wider cohort that the CCG is used to working with. So health and justice and SPECCOM have come together in partnership to make sure that the needs of these young people are picked up. So again, those of you that are familiar with some of these documents on here, Future in Mind and the Five Year Forward View, will be very familiar with where this programme's come from. But for those of you who aren't, um, we have taken this programme right back to 2015 with Future in Mind. There was a task force that was coordinated and chaired by, uh, jointly by NHS England and DOH. Um, and out of that, Future in Mind was published. And it identified key themes showing gaps in the system, um, fundamental changes needed to support emotional well-being and mental health of children and young people. You can see some of those bu bullet points explaining some of the key priorities, needing to pres uh, promote resilience, improving access to effective support, care for the most vulnerable, accountability and trans uh, transparency, and developing the workforce. From future in mind, NHS England developed a five-year forward view for mental health strategy, setting out the priorities to meet those needs, and then implementing the five-year forward view, which outlines the plan for delivery. So within that, we've got a programme, the Transformation Programme, 1.4 billion money pledged to improve the mental health needs of children and young people. And within that programme sits our work stream, and we've got 21 million a year to um, manage the needs of young children and young people, bringing in new innovative programmes. So within the, trans within the trans um, transformation work stream, these three projects, I'll just go into a little bit more detail now, just to explain how they all fit together before we delve into more of the detail. Work stream project one, community forensic cams. It's a project focusing on the needs of the young people community forensic CAMS teams being set up across the country, improving pathways and transfers between local services, trying to minimise the risk of young people moving out of county, out of area, and hoping to minimise those young people that need to go into secure care. Workstream Project 2 is, the, is Secure Stairs, a framework for integrated care. It's a whole system approach. It's what we were talking about this morning. A whole system approach to change, a whole system approach to integrated care. It's predominant, well, it's taking place within the children and young people's secure estate. It's drawing from the trauma systems therapy that we heard about this morning, enabling environments that Ariane mentioned, um, and drawing from psychologically informed environments. Workstream project three is collaborative commissioning networks. This is looking at the pathway, the whole pathway that the young people travel um, in and out of Health and Justice Commission services, so police liaisons, SARCs, in and out of secure children's homes, training centres, YOIs, um, looking at how that pathway can be more joined up. For many people that work with the young people within the custodial estate, we know that there's a cliff edge when they, when they leave. But we also know there's often gaps of information showing when they come in. This is not new, but what we're trying to do is bridge those gaps and understand that pathway and make sure that in local areas we can add value to meet the needs of the, those young people as they travel in and out of those um, pathway services. So you can see that they're very individual projects. However, they are all aligned. How are they aligned? Well, often these young people whether it's collaborative commissioning networks in and out of community or custodial services, secure stairs in the secure estate themselves, or forensic CAMs, these young people are often the same cohort or propensity to be on that pathway. So working together, although three distinct pro projects, we're working very closely with clinical networks, health and justice commissioners, specialised commissioning, and wider stakeholders across the pathways stakeholder engagements to engage with yachts, children's social care, etc., looking to bring everybody together to have a common understanding of the needs of these young people in the whole pathway. We want to address the gaps in the mental health provision. We want to concentrate uh, on this high-risk, high-harm, complex needs population. Um, and where currently some of the traditional service thresholds have not been met, we want to bring added value. 
improving collaboration across all of those wider stakeholders. So and that's a nutshell of an overview of the three work streams. Um, we'll come back to um, next where we are currently and next steps at the end. But before we do, I'll hand over to my colleagues who will take you through each of the work stream projects in a lot more detail. So first of all, I'll hand you over to Dr. Nick Hindley. Hello, everyone. It's really nice to be here. Um, I'll, I'll speak into the microphone. I ho hope you can see. You probably, none of you can probably see the screen, but um, um, but I I think at least it's there, and these slides will be available for you. I, it's a bit odd having the microphone here with me sat in front of it. I've learnt two things this morning already. One is how old I am, because I remember Gordon Bank. Yeah. <laughs> um, and two, that this is the River Saw, which I never knew came through Leicester. So there we are. Um, I am going to be very brief, really, um, and I'm going to start at the end. Um, right. So we're talking today about the Community Forensic CAM service, and um, this is for children who are high risk uh, in terms of harm to others principally, but usually they've got a range of... Um, risk concerns and vulnerabilities, who may or may not be in contact with the youth justice system. And of course, most of you here will be working in the youth justice system. So I hope this strikes a bit of a chord. These are just some vignettes from my practice. I have been the lead clinician for a regional forensic CAM service in the Thames Valley area for the last 15 years. And we've done a lot of service evaluation and model evaluation and development to get to the point where we are today. So it's very based in practice. It's not just been a sort of top down, this is what we're going to do because there's some money there. Um, so we've got a 15 year old boy with serious sexual offenses on remand out of county. He's suddenly come up and he's identified as odd in custody. No previous CAMS involvement. What do you do? Well, our YOS service rang me up and I've been to see him and um, we've developed a clear plan together. 17-year-old boy coming up to transition to adult services with long history of antisocial behaviors and harassment, long, long criminal justice history on a full care order, placed out of county because he's on an anti-harassment order in his own county, and he's, he's known to our service, and what do we do with him? The full care order's gonna end, and he's high risk, and how do we get adult services interested? 14-year-old with learning disability and autism in a special school who's taken a knife in and threatened a teacher on two occasions. First time, we said, well, you know, it's probably a one-off. Second time, we couldn't do that. <laughs> he's already had his Yoss crime... He's, al uh, he's, he's already had his Yoss knife crime intervention and his foster placement, which has been a long-term foster placement, incredibly prote uh, protective, are getting the heebie-jeebies because they're actually fostering younger children as well. Got a 11-year-old uh, girl, long history of maltreatment, suddenly arisen, and she's seriously assaulted a teacher in her primary school. She's now about to go into secondary education. She won't see CAMS. But we've been involved as the Forensic CAM Service in thinking about what needs to happen in terms of safeguarding for her, and then maintaining our involvement so that actually at some stage we can be involved in further assessment if we're needed. 16-year-old boy in a care placement out of county with autism and ADHD. Recurrent serious assaults on care staff. The local CAM service don't know him. He's fantastically complex. And we've maintained our involvement to manage and support that transition before we hand him over, if it's going to last, to the service in the county that he's moved to. And then a 14-year-old girl placed in welfare secure following a range of antisocial behaviors, involvement with YOS, assaults at home, and residential care. So she was placed out of our area. And again, we were, in, we were asked whether we would consider going and seeing her because she belongs to us. She's subject to full care order because she's subject to the um, secure accommodation order. So basically, that's the sort of thing that we get involved with because our local CAM services are absolutely strapped um, they aren't accustomed. 
Sorry, Nick, it's my problem. Oh, right. <laughs> they aren't accustomed to dealing with these sorts of cases, and it's really difficult for colleagues in social care, education, and you know, youth offending services sometimes to get these kind of complex, not sure what's going on here sort of cases looked at. Often, we will say, actually, I don't think it is clearly for uh, a mental health difficulty, but at least then everybody knows that we've seen it and thought about it so that everyone else can get on with what they're good at and without feeling too anxious that there's something there which they should have seen and have missed. So if I go back to the beginning, um, I'll, as I say, these, these slides will be available. I can only go through them very briefly. Um, the whole idea of this is to, that we will have a nationwide implementation of forensic CAM services capable of doing the sorts of things I've described um, and being relatively flexible in terms of you having access to them. Doesn't mean they'll always get directly involved, but there's a graded model so that actually there is support in the cases that really need it. Um, this is a map which shows in 2013 we did a mapping exercise and these were the areas that did have a sort of formal forensic CAM service which, if you like, met a whole range of specialist criteria for that kind of service. It's not saying that other, peop other areas don't have health workers who work in youth offending services and elsewhere, but it's actually having an overarching service which is both linked with local services and with the national specialist provision. And you'll see that actually the vast majority of England is not provided for or commissioned for in the same sort of way that our service in the Thames Valley and some of the services in the Northeast and Northwest particularly were commissioned to do. Um, and if anything from, um, from recent developments, one of the things we're not responding to is diagnosis necessarily. We're responding to concern. So actually, and that is one of the focuses recently in the reports that Sue was talking about, is actually that we do need to be, as mental health services, thinking more about why are other people concerned, rather than judging on the basis of a referral or whatever that, um, oh, this, this, this child's got a diagnosis of that or hasn't got a diagnosis, therefore we're not going to see. The other problem, of course, is that there's a paradigm problem with mental health, which is we might be quite good as mental health professionals as doing assessments, but the intervention may actually be multifactorial, just as Andy was talking about, and come from people like you working in youth justice, from social care, or far more often than um, is currently available often from special educational services. So, um, you know, it's, it's a problem there that CAMs haven't been very good at. Say, they say no mental illness or whatever, but actually you've got a grossly emotionally and behaviorally disturbed child there, and actually people need a bit more of a hand than just to be told no mental illness, um, meaning that we don't have medication or, if you like, special therapy in this particular case. Um, anyone up to 18, so we don't not look at children under 10. All the evidence suggests actually that some children are identifiable pre-10, um, as not going to go away. And that's one of the other things. Um, I won't say any more about that. Um, this is the group of young people, and it's talked about complex needs, and you know this as much as I do. Um, the key model is that we have a small, experienced team who actually can cover quite a broad area. Other areas of medicine have this. Um, if you want a paediatric cardiologist then there won't be one of those in every single hospital. But actually, you will have a paediatrician who could contact a uh, paediatric cardiologist in a specialist centre. And whilst we want to be a specialist team, we want to make sure that actually people can ring us up. So people ring us up from all over the Thames Valley and say, I've got one. Is this one for you, do you think? And sometimes we'll say, goodness me, why don't we know about that? And other times we'll say, well, I don't think it is, but we'll help you th think about who it might be who might be more helpful. So there's the clinical side of things, and then there's a more strategic side of things to a service like this. So you've got to see the children you need to see, but actually you've got to help develop the cross-agency collaboration. So, for example, in our area, I know all the 
directors of social services for children. I know the, who are the leads for SEN. If, if I need to ring them up and say, this child absolutely needs an AHCP and we can't wait 26 weeks or whatever it is. Um, I know our youth justice leads. And so we can have those sorts of discussions when a case really requires it. Of course, you mustn't use that sort of relationship too much. They can come to me as well, by the way, the other way around, and that works quite well. Okay. Um, one of the things that we think we need is um, a service which works in a catchment. So actually, our catchment is the Thames Valley. So if a child from the Thames Valley needs to be seen, and we decide actually that that needs to be done, if they're at Rainsbrook or in Kylo House or uh, in, in some sort of residential placement in Cornwall, then we might need to go and see them there. It's not much good getting them shipped up to see us in a nice aseptic room because actually what we really need to see is what sort of placement they're in. Because some of them, as we know, are the words therapeutic and out of county often don't go together. <laughs> um, and uh, we're all far too keen on thinking that they do. I've said something about the sort of overall functions. Just to say that we need to be authoritative. So people who ring us up need to know that we will provide them with advice and formal consultation and support in some cases. But when we see a case we know we need to be involved with, we'll do it. And we'll help people and we'll get there and we'll help them over the crisis or the difficult stages to get that child as well organized in terms of service provision as we can. If you don't do that, if you just offer advice, then people say, well, all they have to do is offer advice. They never actually get their hands dirty. And, you know, that's one of the quids pro quo. So you've got to show that. And then we've got a range of specialist functions. And one of those is knowing what the different jurisdictions are. So what about EHCPs? It's not good enough for CAMS or someone in CAMS not to know wh what's needed in the EHCP or what's in the Children Act. What's the difference between a full care order and a voluntary care order? You know, those kinds of things we really need to know in this kind of service to actually push it and make sure that some of these very complex, difficult-to-manage kids are going to the right sort of placement. Um, the range of other things, and I won't go into that now. I've very nearly finished. Um, if you like, it's a liaison model, really, but a liaison model that at times really gets in there and does stuff. And these would be the sorts of things people we would be linking up with um, across the board. Doesn't mean we go into custody and provide therapy every week for custody, but you know, two weeks ago I was in an STC seeing a child, that first child, who'd suddenly committed unexplicable sexual offences times three. And so we might need to go and do that because actually it's very difficult for those environments sometimes to get that sort of assessment quite quickly. Um, just to say, this emphasizes really the, what we've done in our area. It's not particularly magical, but the Forensic CAMS Commission bit is that bit on the left. You could see there. Um, if I move this over a bit, then you can see. Um, and that's what we're talking about today. But we were commissioned to do this 15 years ago. And because we said we needed the clinical and the strategic side of things, what we've been able to do is to identify gaps in provision for this group of young people, which in conversations with commissioners and safeguarding boards, we've been able to make the case for a separately commissioned service for children with harmful sexual behavior, a separate service for children who've experienced sexual abuse across a catchment, a county in this case, Oxfordshire, and we've taken on the overall management of the youth justice side of liaison and diversion. So that actually we've got not only have we got the highly specialist forensic CAM side of things, but we've also got now a feed-in to children who are coming into the youth justice system at first point of contact. Um, I'd like to say more, but I can't, so I'll just point out that, that this is what we are planning to have, as opposed to that map I showed you first of all. So actually, these areas, northeastern Cumbria, northwest, Yorkshire and the Humber, in the south, there are three sections. London will have three of these services, and that's clear now, and that's currently 
subject to procure, going to be going to procurement soon. So all of these areas should have a service like this. They should all know each other because we're developing a network. We've got our first meeting in, on Friday. So that actually, if a child from one area ends up somewhere else, although the local service must take responsibility for that, they may be able to be babysat in, in the other area where they're at by the other team. So that's the general idea. I hope it seems relatively sensible. It does sound a bit blue sky to you, but um, it has stood the test of time with us, and I hope that it'll be helpful in the future. Radical. Can I? Uh, it, will it mess the media stuff up if I move <laughs> to the side? Is that going to? Is that better if I sort of step back and? Okay. Hey, brave or what? Okay, so I've got five minutes <laughs> to do about an hour. No, not for you to do about an hour because me and Paul are sharing this bit. So, and I've probably spoken enough already. How do I move it forward? <laughs> Okay, so we're, uh, I'm here to talk a little bit more about secure stairs. The, the, there's um, a, an awful lot more, so we will try and um, shrink it down as much as we can. It's not at the highest level. It's not really rocket science, to be fair. So the context is um, a sort of shift in focus, a recognition in the secure state that this sort of uh, prescribed intervention-based way wasn't, wasn't really meeting the needs of the young people and making the changes that we wanted to. Um, so moving away from focusing purely around the young people and looking across the whole system. It emerged from some work that we did in, in Hindley, but it wasn't just us. It was you know, uh, lots of stuff, the, the Trisha Skew stuff in, in Wales as well. Um, and there's a paper uh, that Paul uh, uh, um, authored that, that you can have a read that, that's, that's on there. Um, but it draws from an, a myriad of other things, include of working with foster carers, which now focus around working with foster carers rather than working with children, which has this emerging, not just evidence-based, but practice-based evidence, so not necessarily RCTs everywhere, but actually people say this feels like a way forward from people who are working at the rock face. Very quickly, slide if you were in the, the previous. So a collaborative whole system approach with embedded services so that, that it's not a service coming in and being expert. We're joining, we're aligning. Nick's phrase about getting our hands dirty as well, not sat in an office somewhere and expecting people to come to us. And, and secure stairs, it's sort of shoved into a bit of an acronym, really. Um, but in, in simple terms, secure is let's get the care right. Let's look after young people. And the people who look after young people in all of these establishments are primarily residential workers, prison officers, residential care staff, on wards and inpatient units, their support workers, uh, people at the rock face. And let's really support them and help them understand attachment trauma principles, why when you work with a young person, it feels so difficult at times when they spit in your face or they say they hate you or whatever it may be. Um, and then use a formulation-based approach rather than a categorical-based approach to guide our and, and um, provide a sequence of our intervention. Yeah. Um, and that is not from a single theoretical perspective. So it's not psychodynamic or systems or trauma or behavioral or criminology or delinquency or risk or whatever it may be. It's not a, because no one single model explains human behavior. We have to integrate all those perspectives, not an educational one, not a social care one, not a CAMS one, not a mental health, not a biological. It's all of those have to be on the table to create a story. Secure, very simply, it is shoved. But what, what do we want as principles? The language around this is really, really important. It is not a model. This is not, this is how you do it. We all sit there and tell you how to do it, and we make lots of money because we can then franchise it everywhere. It's a framework of practice in which lots of this stuff will be being done. Yeah? But it's guiding framework. It's very important, that language. 
So staff with the skill sets appropriate to the interventions. Have we got the right people to deliver the right things? Have we got staff who are emotionally resilient to remain child-centered? Are our recruitment processes uh, right? Do they take into account, do they really tell foster carers and care staff and professionals, do they really tell what this work is really like? Um, do we care for our staff properly? Do we provide supervision and support? Yeah. Are there effective well-being systems if staff are struggling? Do we have a shared understanding across of, of child development, full stop? I don't think you should work with children unless we have an understanding of child development and brain development. We should be learning, and, and lots of this stuff is new. We have to keep learning. Attachment, that's relationships, the impact of trauma, and other elements. We need a reflective system that can embrace and understand the trauma stuff I was talking about. That when it goes wrong, when we all disappear into our silos and we have individual reviews, actually we need to come together and recognize that it's not anybody's specific fault often. That actually we need to learn and be a, a learning organization. And every single interaction matters. That means it's the, it's the way they're greeted as they come in the door in a youth offending service or a residential establishment. The environment matters. Whether you smile or not matters, even if they are shouting at you. Stairs is just formulation, multi-system. So how do we bring all these multiple perspectives together? And we use the, the metaphor, I'm going to just talk like this. We use the metaphor of the, the blind men and the elephant. So these are all different, these are all blind people, we should say, shouldn't we? Um, all with different perspectives. So cams worker, yacht worker, young person, parent, substance misuse worker. And if you take them up and give them different parts of the elephant, they all think they're working with something different. So substance misuse workers working with substance misuse. The cams workers working on mental health. Yeah, and it's only when you bring those people together first before we intervene, not driven by a category, to understand and assess properly what we're working with, get a story that actually they can see that they're all working with an elephant. And we draw from multiple perspectives. And we put that on the table right from the beginning. If anybody thinks they've got the answer now, they're kidding themselves. Nobody has. Doesn't matter what you're training, whatever. Yeah. So what's formulation? Um, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip this bit. You can read it, because Paul needs to come on and talk to you actually about what it looks like. But I am gonna just put another slide up, um, which is hopefully. So this is what we often do. Joe has ADHD, displays violent, has anger management difficulty. So we intervene with medication for ADHD. We give some thinking skills and victim empathy work for anger management. Any nods around the table? This is a formulation that we're, that's developed, and this, this is a composite sort of thing. Joe has difficulties recognizing and regulating his emotions, particular anger. His early experiences of domestic violence have led to a stress response system as always on. This permanent state of high anxiety can explain some of his difficulties in, in attention, because if you're worried about where the next trauma's coming or threat's coming from, you're going to be impulsive, inattentive. Um, his early attachment experiences, characterized by neglect, have led to him being independent streetwise. He doesn't seek help, bottles things up, and overthinking and control um, uh, have developed, which in the short term may seem helpful, but in the longer term builds up emotion. And with this sensitive stress response, we get a bottle, bottle, bang. So he trundles along the floor, tiny trigger, bang, we get some uh, a problem. He's had reduced opportunities to develop emotional recognition and regulation, and to understand the emotions of others, empathy. We're not born with the ability to understand the emotions of uh, others. We develop it over time through relationships. So if we just teach more cognitive skills to control anger or understand the impact of behavior, so if we work on the cortex, the thinking, they may be unhelpful and just help him to bottle it up more if we manage it and keep it under. What we need is a relationship with a caregiver who can co-regulate what we to share and guide and model, model vulnerability and label and discuss emotion. That's how we learn emotional regulation, through relationship. We don't teach children. We don't, we don't sit down with them and give them a worksheet and, and talk about cognitions. We experience a model through relationships. 
Um, he may benefit from kicking a football around um, to release frustration so as he doesn't get to bottle, bottle, bang. And uh, actually, if we're going to work individually, let's work on the anxiety that underpins the anger, not the anger itself. Does that make sense? Okay. A very different way of looking at, at things. That doesn't discount medication as well might be useful, but it's a different story that guides our intervention. <laughs> I could have uh, utterly relied on Andy to do that. Right, um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to talk to two, two or three key slides here. Um, first thing to stress is, as Andy said, it's a framework, it's not a prescriptive model that we're instructing people on how to uh, implement. So the idea is we co produce it with people at each of the, the sites we're working into because we want them to replicate that process when they're working within their teams and with young people. We want co-production where it's a collaborative approach between all of them. Can everybody hear me, by the way? I'm just send me a message around with this microphone. So it's framework, uh, but universal principles. Um, it's got to apply to everybody on site. ESUs may be needed for some young people, and, that's that, and they undoubtedly are, but uh, we want a, a, a model or an, an offer that goes uh, across the sites. Uh, we want it to be based on the explicit acknowledgement that we need to provide a stable and supportive environment for everybody, not just the young people, but for the staff who work there as well. Um, and that we're focusing on the primary caregivers as the key agents of change. Within that as well, just for the benefit of my health colleagues, of which I'm sure there are one or two in the room, but not many, because there rarely are at the Justice Convention. Um, but information sharing is critical to this, and that means real-time information sharing uh, and, and a shared care record that everybody inputs to, uh, and includes a care plan that everybody's working to. Um, so a simple way to visualise it for me is if you go on a unit, um, staff and young people will know the personal officer is, they'll know who the mental health nurse is, um, they will, uh, the, the staff will feel empowered, they will feel they've got some knowledge about what the drivers are for young people's behaviour, they feel supported in terms of their strategies for managing young people, uh, and young people will also feel involved in the care. The care will, um, <laughs> the, the care will be integrated uh, and it, it will be based on a narrative and a formulation, and not only will that inform the care that they get in the centre, in the secure centre, it will inform what happens as they move out into the community. So we're hoping it will support case management processes within the uh, youth family teams. Right, I'm not going to go through the implementation checklist, but just to say there's a number of issues we're looking at around staffing, staff support, use of formulation, case management. Um, in terms of uh, supporting the delivery of this, we're, develop, we're, we're looking to uh, get a, a, an implementation site in each centre which will have senior representation from people responsible for looking after the young people day to day, that's the residential side, the casework uh, or social work side because they're the legal parents, so that would be casework in, in the YOI for instance, whereas in the children's home uh, it, it may be that that's part of the, the, the role of the uh, senior residential staff and the mental health team who are going to be providing a psychologically informed care. It will involve any other disciplines we can get involved in the process, but that's the key, the key players really. And that's going to be supported centrally and is being supported centrally by an implementation team that again reflects clinical perspective and operational experience. And the idea is we will support each centre in terms of working up their own plans to uh, achieve the different elements on the implementation checklist around case management around staff support and development, things like that. Um, and also we're linking it with um, central developments around policy that are happening within YCS, HMPPS, things like that. Um, as well, there is a clinical network we're developing for the clinical leads who are, are going to be responsible for the, the high level, um, if, if, if you will, oversight of this at each centre. So from a clinical point of view, from the mental health point of view, we need senior leadership, high level leadership 
that's, that can provide the containment within the system and the expertise and the experience for the complex cases that we're working with. But we also need boots on the ground. We need mental health practitioners who can work alongside the staff. It's not enough to position, otherwise we'll have a bunch of psychologists positioning themselves as experts. And that's exactly what we're trying to get away from. Um, but professional network will support the development uh, of the, uh, will, will assist with the implementation. It will help with uh, normalizing peer support, peer review. It will help with quality assurance issues and it will help to take things forward because the other long-term goal of the project is to make the project redundant, which is that the, uh, there's a legacy afterwards which is the systems we set in place will be uh, self-sustaining. Um, and to that effect, we've embedded the, the, the work of this, which started as an NHS England project within the governance frameworks of uh, DFE and MOJ, or MOJ, as apparently we now refer to them, <laughs> uh, and HMPPS. Um, also, we're looking at conf a consortium amongst healthcare providers, so that, that can provide a, a um, a financial and clinical framework for the long-term future of this work from a health perspective. Just finally, um, <coughs> a few warnings, red flags. Be careful of the experts, they'll let you down. Uh, expect problems, there will be them. Uh, if the leadership is right, then we, we'll, we're replicating something at a senior level which will play out in, throughout the system. Uh, as it goes down and that will inform on the, uh, the care of the and management of young people. Um, and we actually have to be, if we're going to create resilient systems, we have to actually be able to acknowledge a problem within the system if it exists and be mature enough to, uh, to have a discussion about it. But if we have services or providers that are not playing to the script, we need to be able to have a discussion about that because it's no good pretending we've got all this multi-agency, multidisciplinary stuff and lots of documentation to support it. If the reality is that uh, you know that, that the mental health lead won't talk to the residential lead because they fell out of the decision making of some kid three years ago, does that make sense? Right. Okay. And uh, that's it. Thank you. That's a that's a plus for brevity. That. You, you, you have sold the dead parts there. <laughs> yeah, it's hospital parts. <laughs> ten minutes. All ten. Use them all. <laughs> okay. Okay. I would just like to uh, spend a few minutes just taking you through our experience of establishing collaborative commissioning networks across Cumbria and the North East. So my role is within the health and justice team in Cumbria and the North East to lead specifically on this project. So my background isn't in youth justice nor mental health, but it is in engagement and networking and service improvement, which is why I've been, um, I was sort of brought in to lead this project. So this is a really broad ranging project. I probably could change my It's a really wide ranging project and it considers the whole pathway for this cohort of children and young people. So it, it's really around engagement, it's around understanding what are the gaps um, and it's about, it's very closely linked with the broader children and young people's mental health improvement agenda which is linked to future in mind as Sue described earlier on. It, we heard a lot this morning about breaking down silos and this project really helps to try to aim to support collaboration on the ground and really helps to, to bring that engagement together and get all of those agencies working more closely together. So our approach across the Cumbria and the North East was to, to focus on engagement and building relationships across the area because relationships didn't already exist. There was no network that was specifically focused on this group of children and young people. So we had to set about trying to understand where the gaps were in the system, where the fragmentation was, and think about how we could develop a network. We needed to understand what that meant for our services and for our children and young people and establish our starting points so that we could frame the project going forward. It quickly became apparent that just focusing solely on those health and justice commissioned uh, services, so liaison and diversion and the SARCs and the secure estate, was only one part of the problem. And it was really the interface between all of those services and the gaps that children and young people may fall through as they move through the system. 
so that's why I needed to consider the, the full pathway um, and also the role that I have has very much an advantage of being a central connector so I can see all of the services across Cumbria and the North East and have the opportunity to understand all of the, the services and provision in different areas and link people up and that in, not just in health that also includes youth offending teams, local authority services, voluntary and community sector services and the police so it's thinking very broadly. In terms of establishing the network, the first thing we needed to do was to identify who our key stakeholders were. So from a range of sources, including the health and justice team, they could help with contacts within the services that they commissioned. Um, our YJB relationship manager helped with yacht contacts um, and CCGs and providers, CAMS providers, with some knowledge that I had from my previous role in the clinical network. So there were some relationships already in place. So there was a lot of work done in the early days, which was around going out to meet with people informally over coffee to understand their perspective of the mental health needs of the children and young people that they work with. And that helped to really build a picture of all of the issues that people were coming across in their day-to-day -day work. And again, that was across health services, across sort of local authority, um, the police, youth offending teams, the secure estate. <laughs> and that was commissioners and providers. So it was really trying to build a, a really big picture of what the current issues were. And from these discussions, there was a number of emerging themes came up. So I've got some on the slides. I'll just run through them really, really quickly. Um, these are things that you'll probably find very familiar. I don't think there's going to be anything in here that's going to be a surprise to any of you. So this was some th these were things that were across all of Cumbria in the Northeast. Um, and I would imagine that they're not exclusive to Cumbria in the Northeast. Another key part of this was trying to understand what did the young people think. So while we had the professional perspective, we also needed to find out what do the young people think who are actually accessing these services. So I did some work with a couple of our local service user um, organisations. There was one that was community based, working with young people leaving care. Many of those had an offending history. And there was another who ran a focus group in our, um, one of our secure children's homes. And these are just some of the things that they told me. Again, probably nothing that you haven't heard before. So the progress so far in establishing a collaborative commissioning network for Cumbria and the North East. We held a stakeholder event back in September, which was really well attended by about 120 people from across all sectors. Again, commissioners, providers, operational, VCS, everybody was there. The morning session was a range of presentations from different stakeholders and the afternoon was a workshop session which encouraged delegates to think about what they had in their area, what were their assets, what gaps that they knew of locally and who they needed to involve and what they were going to do next. There is some funding attached to this project which was, is intended to support a collaborative approach to improving services for this cohort of children and young people and that event was to try and shape people's thinking about how can they use that money to the best effect. Following on from the event, we've received business cases covering um, eight out of our 11 CCG areas in, the, in Cumbria and the North East. We have two areas that are leading on um, providing training on the trauma, rehab, trauma recovery model, as you've heard this morning, um, using the same provider that was used in Wales because that has the evidence base and has been well evaluated. And those, that project, one of them covers the entire Northumbria Police Force area and the other covers the entire Cumbria Police Force area. So that's a new way of working for our youth offending teams. There's another project that aims to look at um, identifying and managing speech, language and communication needs with a view of preventing a, a deterioration in mental health and also for those children who are excluded from school, uh, looking to train those staff in the pupil referral unit to try and reduce the amount of time of the out of mainstream education. We have another project which is, it's linked into quite a unique project that we have going on in the Durham Constabulary area um, around the Child Advocacy Project which is linked to their, their SARC. Um, and this is around providing clinical psychology input into the yacht to help to upskill the yacht staff in how they manage their interventions with children who are displaying harmful sexual behaviour. And that covers the, the whole Durham Force area. So 
we've made some good progress since the beginning of the year, uh, but there is still work to do. One of the things is around coverage and trying to, to work out how we can roll out projects across all of the areas. It's, it's important that it has to balance with local need, um, but also make sure that we have an equitable service across the patch. We've established a steering group recently, um, which is more of a, a learning network, and the idea of that network is to share the learning and the knowledge from some of these projects and try and bring people together with the, the common goal of improving outcomes for this group of children and young people. We are taking a North Region approach to this. Um, so we have a health and justice team based in the Northwest and in the Yorkshire and Humber, and together with Cumbria and the Northeast, that makes up the, the North Region of NHS England. So I'm working closely with my counterparts in those teams to, to try and get a North Region approach that we can get some equity across the whole of the North of England and not just in one patch. We're staying very closely linked with the clinical networks, and this is really important. The clinical networks are leading on the, the broader children and young people's mental health transformation agenda, and of which this project is part of that. And it's really important that the, the needs of these kids are linked in with that and that they're not forgotten about. So this is something that you can all be involved with. There's clinical networks in every area, and if you, you need to, some information about how to get in touch with the clinical networks, or how to get in touch with your local health and justice team, or your collaborative commission and networks lead, I'll be around at lunchtime, I can help with that, or Sue can help, so we can link you in and get you involved in the, the local projects. The project is ongoing across the country, it is at various stages, um, and please you know, be involved, because the more people that we have involved with this project, the better. Thank you. Well, there's a wealth of information there. Um, you can see how tremendously involved the projects are and thank you to the speakers for more or less keeping to time um, I've listened to them speak many times and they can go on for an hour and it still me. be absolutely <laughs> captivating so to crush it all into 10 minutes per person has been amazing I was just going to run through um, some next steps uh, and some updates for you but I keep it very brief because I really want to give us an opportunity to have some questions So as you can see with um, forensic cams, we're mobilising um, 10 area specialised commissioning teams. Um, within Secure Stairs, we're mobilising in 20 secure establishments, such as Youth Justice and Welfare. We've got the 20 establishments, but we're mobilising both Health and Justice and we're mobilising from an establishment side. With the collaborative commissioning networks, we've got 10 Health and Justice commissioners across the country. So we're looking at 40 different projects to mobilise. Um, the project runs until 2021, as I say, and we are trying to mobilise or have everybody starting to at least mobilise by the 31st of March. So far, we have 18 out of 40 services currently mobilising, and the plan is that 37 out of 40 um, are estimated to be mobilising by the 31st of March. So um, some significant work has gone on in the last year across all three sectors and some really good partnerships numerous stakeholders involved and as Claire said with the collaborative commissioning networks they're still at different stages there's still opportunities to get involved same with secure stairs we're, we're going into the establishment secure children's homes are further forward Rainsbrook's probably one of our front runners the YOIs are starting to develop their plans now so there's still huge opportunities to get involved there we are in the middle of procuring evaluations for community FCAMs and secure stairs um, preferred bidder notifications went out Monday this week. We're looking to award contracts by December and be mobilising by the 1st of April. We have issued national KPIs, so we will be looking to collect monthly data to keep a real handle on this and monitor progress, collect evidence-based practice and share that. Um, and working really closely with MOJ, HMPPS, DFE and YJB, especially around the youth uh, justice reforms, significant reforms going on across the entire estate. We want to make sure we're aligned and it's not a, just another bolt on that we're aligned, we're aware of capacity issues and priorities for the sector in the estate emphasis the whole time on co-production involving the children the child's voice um, parents and carers voice not only in their plans but in the service development as we move forward 
And I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide because, as I say, questions are more important. But basically, the work continues. We will continue to support all the different 40 projects. We will continue to work with our partners. We're working on funding arrangements to make sure we can move forward as whole system approaches. Um, carrying on with the alignment. Procurements are continuing. And basically, we want to move forward to demonstrate the benefits. Because if we can demonstrate the benefits, the life of the programme may end in 2021. But hopefully, the funding will become recurrent and we will be able to have all of these projects mainstreamed and ongoing. So thank you for listening to us. That's the three workstream projects in a nutshell. I think we should have seven or so minutes left for questions. So I'll open it up to the floor. Hi. From a project management point of view, it's, it's certainly on our risk register. Um, what we're finding is that we're not finding that to be the case currently. However, we are still early days. We are mobilising. And as you say, um, for, for Wales, and I know you're running your enhanced case management model into the southwest, so you've got a decent sized patch there. We are obviously looking at clinical psychiatry, um, forensic psychiatry, clinical psychologists across the country. But actually, a lot of the focus, again, is about boots on the ground. It's the mental health practitioners. We haven't found it an issue as yet. It is being monitored. We speak with our commissioners uh, on a regular basis and hold steering groups quarterly. The feedback so far has been positive, but we are watching this space. Can I don't I, know whether uh, my colleagues want yeah. to come in on this. Yeah, I think, I think use, use of the, the, the language. I think one of the big, big things is recruitment. Um, and one of the things I wanted to say as part of it is that this is a, this is a massive challenge. Um, it, it, it is a paradigm shift, changing that fundamental question. And that challenges clinicians. I think it challenges health clinicians uh, to, and, and organisations to work in this way. Um, we talk about competencies, if we're honest, in terms of the language, rather than focusing on a single profession. There are a range of applied psychologists. Psychological need doesn't necessarily mean you need a psychologist. I do think you can't have a psychologically informed model without strong psychological leadership, if I'm totally honest. But, but I think we do need to think about practitioners who can support, who are psychologically informed. Um, but recruitment, I do think, is, is one of the big risks, is how do we create clinicians or support clinicians within health to work in this very different way, in health particularly, but to work in this very different way, when sometimes the organisations in which they've grown up and developed don't necessarily support them to work in this way or get really anxious and then pull them back into other different ways of working. So I don't think it's about there's not enough of a certain group. I think it's about expanding that group, um, but, make, but making sure they have the competencies to draw from multiple theoretical perspectives, to hold systems, to retain that perspective, and to formulate rather than to drop into traditional ways of, of understanding. Long answer, but, but it, is a, it is a challenge. And, and I, think, I think part of the... The, the support is about bringing a clinical network together to actually help them to bring other clinicians through the system to support the process going forward. Thank you, Andy. Um, another question. Yes. We couldn't do it without having that sort of idea. 
one of the things we've done, because we have a small team, but a very experienced team, covering, I, we cover 2.5 million in the Thames Valley. Um, and what, what you need to do is to, you've got your core team, but actually you need to develop people like you as strong links. So actually, you know you can ring us up, and we know we can ring you up. And that actually you feel supported by us in the way I described, that actually, if you've got one that said, if you've got something which you say, I think we really need a hand with this one, can you come and see, then we'll do it. But, um, but most of the time we'll be supporting you because you'll be doing the right thing and you may need someone to check it out with. So we, we know, and one of the key things about this is knowing, is making sure you've got a model which picks up the right, the sort of children, young people you should be picking up. But it's also about identifying the professionals because in some areas professionals will be much stronger in working with this group of children, whereas in other areas of your catchment they won't be. And so as a service, we've got to know how to respond to those differential needs because actually what you're doing is responding to a network. Because actually, what in the end, the, the, the area that isn't so good at working with that particular sort of problem may need us to go, whereas in the other area, we wouldn't have needed to go. And we need to understand that, and then we can help provide the training for the area that actually isn't as confident. And part of that training is about being there and then joining us and seeing that what we do is not rocket science. Um, so I suppose it's as you describe it and what you're describing is exactly how we'd want to be. We do, uh, in the Thames Valley, we have regular Camsios link worker meetings for our area because we un identify the youth vending teams as being particularly important in thinking about this group of young people. And so, you know, every three months we meet up with them and we have a, a consultation session we think about who's doing what, is it going okay, what are the constraints, all of those sorts of things, as well as any clinical cases. And that means you can maintain the contact and then people can get in touch with you in between and they're not worried about sending you a 95-page referral letter. You know, actually, they can just say, pick the phone up and say, can I just discuss this one with you? And we do that all the time. And we've talked about, uh, it draws on the trauma-informed ideas and the trauma. It's about actually providing services that genuinely help people manage the anxiety around these cases and joining with them, regulating with them, um, and, and not being an expert to say you've done it right or you've done it wrong, rather than we'll join you in the mess and we'll just, we'll just give you a bit of support. And we've talked about that a lot, isn't it? Anxiety think, management, really. I think there's a tension about not being an expert, actually, because yeah. actually you, you know, you wouldn't be ringing someone up if you didn't think that they could help they you. Value. And you, no, wouldn't no, be, right. you wouldn't be asking Absolutely. someone who you thought was a complete idiot to do that, <laughs> would you? Because actually, you'd, you wouldn't bother ringing them up. So actually, there's a tension between realising that you're suitably qualified, you know, being sufficiently authoritative, but yeah. also being very accessible and able to think, I suppose psychologists would say, Socratically. Yeah. You know, and um, you know, thinking about it from different perspectives. The whole, the whole model is about integrated leadership. So, you know, in a, in a secure establishment, or in a YOI, the governor's the boss, fundamentally, because they're the person in charge. In a foster home, the foster carers are, in, are the boss. They take ultimate responsibility. But it's, a, it's, it's ensuring that those leaders are aligned 
Um, so it's shared responsibility. In terms of the sharing of information, that's about calling that out. And that's what I mean about these ideas, actually really challenging traditional systems. We all know when things go wrong, the criticism is people didn't, one of the crit significant, people didn't share information. It's crazy that the carers of young people who were there 24 hours a day looking after them don't know what went on in that, in that room with that, with that therapy yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So. I mean, there's a real balance here between, I mean, any child who's in a secure setting, in my view, you should be sharing information as a matter of good practice. Of course you should. Uh, you know, I, I don't see why not. Now, there's a balance, isn't there, between the child feeling that everything they're saying... It, th we have something called Caldicott guidelines, for example, in health, which are very helpful in terms of saying you share the information for the purpose required um, according to the need. Now, it seems to me that we all get too bound up with information sharing. It seems to, I'm a safeguarding lead as well, and it seems to me that that group of children, one should be sharing almost as what is needed to make the plan work between professionals. And usually the people who don't share it are the people who don't understand that, in my experience. And actually they need to be challenged, be challenged to actually do that. And often they're people who aren't used to working so much across systems. They're often in their own bit, as you describe. And um, so I think, and you'll find that most areas, the safeguarding boards in most areas, will have joint information sharing yeah. guidance. Yeah. And um, actually, all these different organizations that say they've got different thresholds, if you go to that safeguarding board information sharing guidance, it will say, yeah. it will support you. Um, so I completely take your point, and I think it's a very well made. And actually, it's usually the health professionals yeah. who are worst at this, yeah. Yeah. and um, I think overly sometimes protective. Yeah. The most best way to do this is to ask the young person, and they're all generally so used to everyone sharing sure, their information all the time. Okay. <laughs> but, um, and if they say yes, and their families say yes, then it doesn't seem to me that there's much of a problem. If they say no, then you say right. How badly do we need this, and what are the concerns if we don't share it? Yeah. And usually, it's a no-brainer. I think there's a, there's a slightly wider issue, which is about, sorry, so I'll only no. very briefly, but it's about real-time sharing of information in residential settings. Something's happened on the unit before the child goes to school, you need to know about it. Just like the unit staff need to know if something's happened to the young person while they're in school. But it's one of the key issues we're addressing within the Secure Stairs uh, uh, implementation is to ensure that uh, there is a, a meaningful real-time updating of information onto a common care record, which is looking very much like it's going to be um, the, the sort of the asset uh, sort of case management thing. And the expectation will be that every discipline will put key information on there uh, in relation to the young people. But it's, it's important to hold on to that bit about trauma. The more anxious people get, the more siloed they get. Yeah. Communication starts to break down and they feel anxious about sharing information. Yeah. So, so it's not, it, it, it's, we have to be very careful not to blame across. No. It, it, it's often people don't share information and the, the hidden need is anxiety fundamentally. So then the intervention is, how do I talk to people's anxiety about sharing that information? Once we help them feel safe around where that information's going and what, then they're much more likely to do that. And that's, it. by the way, this isn't a new idea. Um, <laughs> there was a very famous paper by someone called Isabel Menzies Lithe called Containing Anxiety in Institutions in 1961, I think it was, um, which described this perfectly. There are a whole load, a teaching hospital in London was worried about losing all its nursing students. So she went and sat in the institution and spotted that they were all, all the students were being put without supervision next to the illest, most complex patients who were probably dying. And realized, and that was the solution, was actually, and the senior nurses and senior staff were doing the off-duty uh, in the office in the background. And um, so it's by far not a new phenomenon, this. It's not one we've suddenly, or Andy's suddenly thought about. You know, it has been recognized and it would be really good if we can think about getting it recognised a bit more. An institution, by the way, isn't a closed institution. You know, it could be uh, as community cam service, it could be a social care department. It doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't have to have a wall around it to be an institution. And that's one of the things sometimes we get wrong as well in our sort of way we think about those things. Anyway.
We've lunch. reached our time, yes, yeah, so um, thank you everybody. If you've got any further questions, we will be around for lunch in some of the afternoon. Thank you very much.